The global economic recovery is hardly upon us. Every time things look encouraging, clouds quickly form on the horizon. Let's explore the impact of significant world events on our economic prospects with Don Cox. He's the chairman of Cox Advisors LLP in Chicago, Illinois, and it's good to have you back up here in Toronto. Pleasure. Because you're, you're, I was going to say you're from here anyway, yeah. so it's nice to get you back. Uh, as we consider the impact that these cataclysmic events around the world are having on the economy, let's just start with this. Characterize the U.S. economy today, if you would. The U.S. economy is doing okay, but we haven't been able to put three good quarters together. So uh, okay, but not fabulous. Up and down. And actually, as good as it is, um, it's not that much better than Europe. And if you took out fracked oil and gas, it would be barely better than Europe. That's that's been the thing. U.S. has moved from being the fifth biggest oil producer in the world to being the first in a matter of five years. There's nothing like that has ever been seen before. And it creates thousands and thousands of jobs, good paying jobs. It also, uh, with frack gas, has lowered their um, costs of electricity and heating uh, to the lowest in the industrial world, helping the factory side of the economy to recover because it was losing competitiveness internationally. And uh, it's uh, now we get the flip side of the other big invention which has changed a lot of the U.S. economy, which is the use of genetically modified seeds. Mm. So the U.S. Corn Belt is producing the most fabulous results in corn and soybeans in terms of, of supplying low cost food. Uh, and the interesting thing is. That isn't happening over in Europe and other places because uh, people like Prince Charles, real experts, call it Frankenfoods. So those two inventions... I'm hearing sarcasm there. Yes. I, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking you're being <laughs> facetious. Well, it's interesting that fracked oil and gas is bitterly opposed uh, by uh, the leftist sentimentalists on the fact that uh, this is bad for the environment. Genetically modified seeds are opposed, even though they're lowering food costs for the world. Those are the two most... In important in inventions in terms of their application in this millennium. The well, U.S. is leading in both of them. Let's not debate the relative no. merits of those here. But only to say, if those two, economically speaking, encouraging things are happening, what is preventing the United States economy from being stronger than it evidently is? Well, for one thing, it's, it's got all sorts of problems in the public sector. Uh, and this is a terrible burden financially. And uh, the educational system in the U.S., I want to tell you that, uh, isn't up to the job, the public educational system. And so, therefore, um, the opportunities that should be created by all the things that are being done by smart people and so forth, not a lot of them are, in fact, being done elsewhere rather than in the U.S. And those are, those are the, the two biggest factors that I see. And, of course, um, now we have the fact that, once again, as Model and Albert put it a few years ago, the U.S. is the indispensable nation, which means when there's a really bad crisis out there, the U.S. has to step up to the plate. We'll talk about those in a second, but as you look at the United States, the homeland it, you know, has not suffered an attack since 9-11. There's no outbreak of Ebola yet. Probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, you haven't got some... You know, crazy, uh, you know, people as it's going on in the Middle East right now trying to take over. Uh, the, the United States should, I mean, theoretically, things should be better than they are, right? Well, remember that the banking system in the United States uh, nearly got wiped out at the top level in the crash. And um, Haven't it, come back from that yet? And it's, well, what's happened is that the penalties imposed on the banking system uh, in their wisdom, the administration chose to punish the stockholders of the companies, and they've taken billions and billions and billions of dollars out in fines. Now, the big bad bonus banks, as I call them, their balance sheets weren't that strong anyway. So what's happened is, out of their stockholders' equity, gigantic amounts have been drained, which means that these banks are struggling to keep up with their financial ratios under the the international rules. So that means that they aren't, they don't have as much heft as they should have. That's a drag on the economy? And then the other thing is something else, which is that they 
They chose under regulation to apply the 2,000 pages of regulations of the Dodd-Frank law mm -hmm. to virtually all banks. Now, Wall Street hires lawyers, lobbyists, accountants, and so forth to deal with this. But the smaller community banks, when they get stuck with literally 2,000 pages of regulations, they can't cope with this. And they're, they're having to add to their staff all sorts of experts. So they don't have lobbyists. So one of the most important ratios that I see in looking at things is the relative performance of the, of the community banks in the U.S. relative to the S&P. And it's been going down, down, down over the last six months. And that means those are the ones that make loans to local businesses mm -hmm. uh, and where they know the people. They make loans like that. Wall Street does financing for the big companies. So that means that since about 80% of jobs are estimated to be created by small and medium-sized businesses in the U.S., it means the banks that make their living off those businesses are not doing as well as they should because they are being buried under by regulations. They didn't cause the crash. It was the big bad banks that did. And yet they're and feeling they're the impact. Having to, hmm. I mean, this, this is a gross abuse. Okay, let's go regulation. overseas. Uh, that's the American situation. Talk to us about Europe. How is it looking right now? Well, um, not looking good because their energy costs are very high, very high. I mean, and of course, in the case of Germany, they've shut down, they're shutting down their nuclear facilities. Uh, and so uh, they're, they have extremely high energy costs. Then they are having to bear the brunt of dealing with Putin because a big amount of exports from Europe have gone to Ukraine and Russia. And this was an economy which was sort of teetering on the edge of not doing much. You take away a major, two major export markets from them, and what you find out is that drives things down closer to the zero level. So they, Europe is a significant loser out of Putin's aggression. Russia and Ukraine, though, did come to an agreement on gas the other day. Shouldn't everybody be breathing a bit of a sigh of relief over that? No, sir. Why no, not? Sir. Because there's so much else that has to be done. And meanwhile, Russia is subsuming the Donetsk area where they're, uh, and so the central government is, with its desperate resources is trying to protect that. And losing Crimea was a huge blow to uh, Ukraine. Uh, they are, their economy is going down at about seven to eight percent coming into winter. And they got a deal on gas, but it's extremely expensive gas, much more than Canadians or Americans pay for gas. So uh, it, it is a situation where they're, they're going to be on near life support from the European Union, which doesn't have a lot of extra hmm. blood to share. How much of a drag is the Italian economy on the European Union, given it is, it's a big sized economy, but it's in bad, bad uh, trouble, is it not? Well, it's been a drag. Forever. I mean, they haven't had economic growth for seven years. And um, the only reason they have an economy as large is because they have always, ever since the battle with Margaret Thatcher, they've always included the underground economy, the ones that don't pay taxes, prostitution and things, they've included that in GDP. They did that in order to get an equal vote with Britain in the EU. She fought that vigorously, but that got their GDP up to Britain's level. Hmm. So these parts of the economy that don't pay taxes even. Uh, and when given all the costs, so what you've got is Italy, great place to visit, but it is uh, not <laughs> too a many, uh, Too it many is, bunga bunga parties. Yeah, it, yeah it is. It is uh, so it's uh, uh, about as charming a place as there is in the world, but uh, it doesn't work economically because it's shot through with all the corruption hmm. all the way through the system. Let's talk about Hong Kong, the, the umbrella protest that we've seen over the past several days. Uh, what, what do you think the impact on the Chinese economy as a whole those protests could have? Well, the Chinese economy, not much, because there's only 7 million Hong Kongers. But um, on the perception about China uh, uh, as to whether or not it can be a reliable partner, it's a big one. Because uh, this, after all, this was something negotiated by Margaret Thatcher. The rules were clear. And now they're planning to 
undo those rules. And this just reinforces the fears of uh, the other neighbors of China. Uh, you notice how Modi came out and did these massive fundraising rallies uh, in the United States. He's now spending money on armaments because he and the Japanese are both concerned that this is a rather new and aggressive China, and this just reinforces the view that China is trying to become um, something, uh, a sort of a post-communist, communist society. I note that the Premier of Ontario announced this week that she will, later this month, take a delegation of uh, public and private sector people to China for her first visit there as Premier of Ontario. Uh, do these visits really help? Oh, absolutely. Because one of the things that they do is that they do build connections. And those uh, connections and trade and so forth. Uh, and so that's, I mean, let's go back to the first one that was ever done, Nixon in China. Mm -hmm. That was a ch world changing event. There have been no communications, whatever, between the Chinese and the United States and ever since, and there's always been communication. It's better to still jaw, 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 as Churchill says. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, the answer is anybody who regards those as just joy rides isn't. This is, a, this is an extremely important economy that is going through an adjustment process where there's no historic precedent for this. Things could go wrong. But what you don't do is say, I'm going to turn your back on it. No. No, I understand. And I think uh, Prime Minister Harper learned that lesson the hard way when he first came into office because he did try to turn his back on China and mm -hmm. quickly t change his mind about it. But uh, there's no question every time a Western leader goes there, and Kathleen Wynne will find this out as well, the only questions the media ask about are not all about the deals you signed, but whether you lectured them on human rights. So does that really help our relationship well, with them? If that's Not much point in lecturing them on human rights, okay? You're well, a guest, but... all right? The fact that you're there as a representative of a democratic government and a democratic society is a lecture in itself. And that other thing is uh, a false piety. Okay, let's take our remaining moments here and talk about what's going on in the Middle East right now. This uh, barbaric outfit called ISIS or ISIL has taken over much of Iraq and Syria. And I wonder how you see this instability, at mm -hmm. the very least, uh, affecting the global economy right now. Oh, it's a major, major effect. Because this is now an unwinnable war. Uh, because uh, Mr. Obama is forced to try to, he's got 500 million out of Congress to arm the very lawyers and pharmacists which he wouldn't send help to when they were trying to fight Assad. And uh, to deal with these really skillful operatives and whose pace and success has been amazing. They are a threat not just to stability there but for the whole world. And so they are in addition to this concatenation of crises that we've had. The post-Cold War era of calm is over. And I believe that from a financial system sense, we've got to have reduced price earnings ratios as they were during the Cold War, where you knew that more money had to be devoted to defense. Everybody scaled back their defense budget to around 2% of GDP except the US. They're going to have to be increasing them. That's going to be additional strain. In addition, when new crises spring up, things go wrong with that. And so this is tough for the stock market. And uh, when the economies are, are fragile anyway, we don't need new struggles. Let me put something out there just as devil's advocate, and you tell me why it's ridiculous. You started by telling us that the U.S. is now big time into fracking. It is now uh, much less reliant on foreign sources of oil and mm -hmm. energy yeah. than it yeah. ever, probably ever has been. Yeah. Uh, so w why do we still have to care so much about what ISIL is doing in Syria or Iraq when America is becoming increasingly energy independent anyway? We've, being whom? Who is we you're speaking I for? guess the Americans. Okay, the answer is Americans still have to do that because they know that the United States cannot stand by and watch an organization like this threaten that whole part of the world. Something, I mean, the United States has to come in and help solve the problem. That's, that's the role of but being- that's politics. That's not energy policy. No, no the U.S. solves its own energy policies. Mm -hmm. This is not being done to fight about oil over there. This is being done to save human lives and to prevent radicals who have access to modern technologies. The United States on 
19 Saudis brought down the Twin Towers of the United States. The uh, technology for terrorism has advanced dramatically since then. The United States believes that the stronger these terrorists get, the more likely the U.S. will be hit. And I believe that's true because what ISIS could prove to the rest of the world is they were as good as al-Qaeda if they could make a, 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 an attack on U.S. shores. Uh, so therefore, there's unanimity between Democrats and Republicans on this, that the U.S. is still the only way that any Muslim radical group can prove that it is the successor to the caliphate. They have to hit the U.S. So the answer is the U.S. has to get in there. It's ironic. Uh, six and a half years, of, uh, where are we here? Six years into President Obama's presidency, he seems to have finally found the item on which he can unite Democrats and Republicans. They seem to be in concert on this one. Well, this is a case where the public, the, the, the vote, the opinion polls swung so drastically, he has no choice. He's being dragged into a war he doesn't want. Right on. Don Cox, thanks so much for coming into us Plenty. tonight. Good Appreciate it. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.